Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to speak in English. I do speak Hebrew. Uh, I recently came back uh, to Israel after many years abroad. Um, I'm a sole proprietor. For those who don't know, this is, means that's my more or less. Um, and I develop software, and I'm a computational disease model. I'm not a lawyer. However, some of the things I'm talking about will be related to laws. Uh, I'm going to talk about open source, its sustainability, and license called CC0. Um, I do have to declare a conflict of interest. Um, usually people have to declare something they have to gain from. So I listed all the elements uh, according to some common format of how to declare a conflict of interest. However, I do want to tell you, uh, any entities in Britain here have nothing to do with what I'm saying. What I'm saying is my own thoughts, and this is from my own experience of about more than 10 years, more than a decade on my own before that, doing disease models. And um, I saw open source from both directions. Once from developing open source for an institution, and once going on on my own and developing proprietary software. And I view open source from both directions, and my conflict of interest come, in a sense comes from both sides. Today from a different side than when I used to be in the past. So I will tell you things and you will judge later what, what side you want to pick. But these are my own views and only mine. Um, I benefited from open source. I worked at an institution that paid me to actually do open source for many, several years. It was very nice, very good, but at some point I had ideas that I couldn't implement in that institution. Since I developed open source software, I could go outside, jump outside the institution and continue the sa developing the same thing. And this is actually what I did. I took the open source software, I changed it. It was a disease modeling uh, engine. Uh, I changed it, I rebranded it, I made sure all the licenses are correct and continued communicating with the institution, making sure everything is kosher. Uh, now it's released under the name MIST, the micro simulation tool. It's a tool for disease models. On top of this engine, I built something called the reference model for disease progression. Uh, I won't bore you with details, but it's a very sophisticated ensemble model. Uh, I had many, many achievements. I list some of them here. Uh, so, and this is something that I've been doing for over a decade on my own. I invested my own funds into doing this. So, and, and first I thought it was something short and small and a short story, a short project, but I've been doing it over a decade and reached heights that many others haven't reached in, in my field. I started patenting my work at some point just to protect my investment. Think about it, for many years I've been doing the same thing. I need some level of protection. So, if I tell you I benefited from open source because I did something that you couldn't do if I didn't have open source software. I took the code outside the institution I was developing it and continued. So why am I here? Why am I telling you why, why am I telling you things that are not like, the, not the same? I'm telling you basically open source is not really sustainable. Today, to actually continue developing open source, I'm, I find other projects so I can continue developing some of the code. I no longer sometimes release all the open source. I just keep it to myself or have new versions that I don't release. Um, and the reason is because Funding prefers sometimes if you seek funding, uh, especially if you do it as a sole proprietor, they prefer larger organizations, teams of people, and even if you have good ideas, well, they don't necessarily choose you. It seems odd sometimes. Uh, potential users sometimes uh, prefer commercial solutions over the open source. You give them something for free and even support them for free and they tell you, oh no, we would rather pay this person who gives us a course, but I'm teaching you. No. They want something as a heavy user like that. Um, sometimes uh, if you, someone like a bigger institution says, oh, you know, it's a small piece of software, we can do it ourselves. 
because open source people make many versions of the same thing and well there are many versions of uh, engines for disease models for, uh, for example but even if you bypass all of those things you get to the point that even open source it's supposed to be free and open starts developing lots of control issues and, and the first two today, talk today were actually mentioned some of those things but let me tell you stories that actually happened to me so let's go back before I tell you about stories let's talk about how open source actually works it piggyback rides on copyright law today copyright is recognized by most countries in the world there's actually a convention that countries uh, actually register it slightly changes between places but uh, in locations but generally it's accepted copyright law is a means of protection of your intellectual property in the US for example uh, there are several other ways to protect your intellectual property patents is one of them uh, the idea of copyright was that if you are a writer or a creator and you write some work then no one can just take it away from you and didn't sell it this was the original idea but then again it evolved through time and many many things change within software the open source mechanism allows you to actually take and piggyback rights on the restriction. Copyright is a restriction, it's a legal restriction, and it says, no, you're restricted unless you're doing this and that and that. So if you are the original owner of the copy of the of the source code, you can release it under different licenses. You can take the same code, release it under MIT, B, uh, GPL. BSD and each one of those lives on their own and has its own restrictions and laws. But once someone else adds, to, adds code to the, and, and have a version which is kind of communal, then you have to get into an agreement between people to actually make any changes in the license. Now, uh, I don't know, but how many times you saw a parliament of people actually voting the same way? kind of like it becomes impossible so once you have many voices then all voices turn in their direction and nothing really happens so what happens in cases of disagreement so I'll tell you stories that actually happened to me I jumped outside an institution I was had to negotiate with them some uh, several times in 2017 I left the institution in 2012 uh, in 2017 um, I developed different software, but I took an example from MIST, the, the open source GPL software that I was, had, had the dual ownership of the old institution. I took the example later, I removed that example, so there was no code overlap, but technically since I started GPL and it all carries, and I still I wanted to be courteous, I actually talked to the institution and asked them, look, can we release it under a different license? Will you allow me to do this? Well, they denied me. So there was an over-interpretation here from both sides. I won't go into details, but uh, the point is that when you actually sign up to the original rules of this or that license, you may not really understand what you're signing in, especially if you're not a lawyer. And when I started developing, I thought, oh, yes, this is great, free software, like, and, and they're paying me to do this. Many years later, I find out, yeah, I have ideas, but it's not really something easy to do under those terms. So uh, I was denied. We eventually reached some agreement to release things under LGPL, so something that the problem was resolved. Several years later, 2019, I found out, for, I found out from um, a different source that told me, oh, you know, they're not using the software that uh, you wrote. So I'm the only, basically, I'm the only maintainer or developer. Um, and this is what I was heard. And in 2020, COVID started. And I needed to adapt my tools to, ap to apply to infectious disease other than the chronic disease like I was working before. And many people tried to model COVID. So at that point, I, and, and, even, even the, the institution there, there, was, there were people from that institution writing, oh, you should release things openly so people can learn more about this disease. There was actually a paper in science about it. And um, in 2020, when I started working on COVID, I, I figured out, whoa, the amount of changes I need to make, make and many years of work I did on this new version that I have of the engine, 
I should probably ask for ownership so I can make changes because I also at that point I already had patents and I, I wanted to control a little bit better what's going on. I asked for permission to take ownership, well, I was denied. So I asked them, okay, let's change the license to something more permissive that will help do this, like CC0. I was denied again. I'm going to talk about CC0 in a second. So what really is happening is that now the permissive GPL license is being used and it's not so permissive way as a restriction, just like it is. Remember, copyright law is a restriction. And this happened to me. And this is after I invested a lot of time and a lot of effort doing something. So people actually say many times that restrictions like patents are evil. Some people say it in some communities. Let's compare, John, only the restriction part. Let's compare a GPL to a patent. So I wrote down the table, and you can see each one of those categories, how GPL behaves and how uh, patents behave. So I won't go each one of those. I don't know. I don't. You can later download those presentation and look up those things, but just give you an idea. Duration of a patent is one generation. It's about 20 years. While copyright law is a generation. It, sorry, not generation. It's a lifetime of a person. So, patents are shorter than uh, GPL. More than this, patents become public domain at some point when they expire. Uh, and you can reuse them and you can expire them earlier if you don't pay the, fee, if you don't pay the maintenance fee. So, and you actually have to pay a maintenance fee every several years. Okay, so, so there was a question here, the, the argument here that's coming from the audience that uh, there is a section there about GPL in relation to GPL and patents. Yes, GPL actually doesn't allow you to have a patent in parallel or, allow, or makes you release your patent to the public. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to do it. Yes, you have to release if you if you're using the GPL license, you have and you have a patent, you must license licenses for free only for this embodiment of the software. Yes, I agree. But oh yeah yeah yeah. But what I'm doing now, I'm comparing the restrictions. I'm not talking GPL. Uh, GPL doesn't work nicely with patents. If you own a patent, you have to give it away. The idea of GPL is to actually make things freer. While if you worked on the patents, you may not want to do this. So this is where like the difference is. Um, screening patents take a long time to actually get. Someone checks you. GPL, you can actually write down the copyright statement at the co uh, GPL license, and that's it. It's kind of like a, you, you already applied the restriction. Everything else falls from copyright law. Um, so if I go and summarize all of these, and I would say patents are harder to get. They have private ownership. Um, they are shorter term. And they provide you with incentives. Okay? While GPL is easy to get, it has some communal ownership. Uh, a longer term restriction because it's a lifetime and it gives you a little incentive like selling things is kind of harder in GPL. Think about it. you can sell maintenance, you cannot sell the product itself. So uh, probably this is why GPL is used less. Uh, there are some indications that it's, it's licensed, it's declining in numbers and today the first talk today was actually something that touched about it. Um, oops, wrong number, wrong button. And I do want to talk about another license called CC0. CC0 is a type of, today there are new licenses that kind of ignore copyright. They go more towards public domain. Public domain is something that uh, a government document in the US, for example, uh, unless restricted otherwise, then uh, you can copy from it. 
and you can uh, and you can actually make copies and, and release it. There is no restriction. There is no copyright on the document itself. And the idea was in 2010 that they released it is that it says no rights reserved instead of all rights reserved, which is what you write in copyright statement. The license is honest. It tells you there are other restrictions in the law. And the restrictions can be patents, can be some other acts or legal uh, or, or laws that prohibit you from doing things. While you don't see those in open source licenses. Open source licenses tell you, oh no, you're allowed to do things. And sometimes confuses people who think that what they're doing is correct. And, and I've seen examples of those in the past. I won't go into details. And the number of projects is growing. Today, there are like 400 uh, projects in PyPy, specifically in Python. And this number is growing more and more with CC0 licenses. CC0 is a, a spare, extremely useful for examples. If you have software, even if you don't release it under uh, a CC0 license, the examples, at least, it's a good idea to release because then everyone can copy from them verbatim. No problem there. Um, however, and there are some issues with CC0. Not all organizations actually consider it an open source license. And this is something that I wanted to know people to know, and I'm giving this talk here for the Macor, so people who actually go govern this body will actually know what's going on and consider it seriously. Because there are some organizations that do recognize CC0 as open source and some don't. The Journal of Open Source, it's a journal that publishes software papers about software, basically. Uh, it's affiliated to NumFocus. Uh, you may know NumFocus from PyData, for example. Uh, uh, they, they did not accept CC0 as one of the licenses that they will publish in CS3 as open source software. There's an issue in GitHub about it. I actually talked to NumFocus that kind of partially funds them. And I, and I asked them, why don't you accept CC0? So they actually, the president took the example, my message says, no, no, we want to include all CC licenses. He went back to the board, and then everyone agreed, they voted against it. They stuck with the OSI decision. OSI is the open source initiative. That they did not approve CC0. They actually started the, the People submitted the CC0 for consideration, and then they started the debate. And because CC0 actually works nice with patents, uh, they decided uh, uh, they started the debate. And at some point, the proposal was withdrawn. So OSI never approved CC0. There are some other uh, licenses that are closer that they did approve, but not this one. So. Um, my question is whether there should be one organization decides what's open source and what's not, or let people decide. Um, I do know that in the world of biology, there is a problem of many, many, many tools or very many models that you need to actually go and release, and you need to combine them. They need to be reproducible. You have to be able to integrate them. And you have to make everything traceable, just like software, transparent. And sometimes even people would like to commercialize some of those tools to make them more sustainable so you can actually develop them further. So in this world, there is a problem, and people saw it, and a repository like Biomodels now suggests uh, CC0 as a license that they ask people to release models for. And we actually had a group. You can see there's a publication. We had big discussions about it. and. Um, uh, you can actually go for, check out the links. Uh, the big group of scientists decided also, we had wrote, written down all things with, this, uh, with biological modeling that are of interest for us. We had 12 topics, one of them was licenses, and we did recommend CC0 eventually. It, it took us quite a bit to get this, this debate. <coughs> so at this point, I'll open up for questions. I know there are some people interested in this. Uh, you can find out more information about me here. So uh, the question is, what's the difference between people CC0 and public domain? So apparently, uh, you have to look, and I'm not a lawyer here, but there is no such definition as public domain in some jurisdictions. 
I didn't know about this as well. It seems so natural, but apparently some places you have to have copyright. So actually CC0 has a fallback. It says as close as possible to public domain. You can actually read the fine print, but some places just you have to have the uh, copyright happens the minute you actually do it. So it's kind of hard to actually say that there is something like a public domain because you actually someone written it. So CC0 says the I, the person, am releasing it for the public. And I'm basically I'm giving away my rights. This is kind of the language of CC0. And you can do it with one sentence, but look at the final print when you do this. There are actually final print around CC0 that you should know about because while doing this, you have to know that you're not violating patents, you're not uh, doing something against the law or things like that. The question is whether CC0, there is no obligation to declare whether you have a patent or not. So, n not, there is no... no what? So I have to repeat what you're saying. You're saying that it's trolling. You actually kind of I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase. I'll try to rephrase what you're saying. You're saying it's saying you're kind of dishonest by releasing something under CC0 and then having some other restrictions. Yeah. You can actually do this if you're very smart. You can actually do this with other means as well. If you and you can do those things. The thing is, look, being dishonest is one thing, but uh, CC0 does allow you to have a patent while still releasing the code, which is actually better than just having, not being able to release the code, or there's something called trade secrets, which is another category of restrictions which say you, you don't tell us how you're doing things. So you have to choose. If you don't like this license, you don't have to use it. But sometimes you do have something you want to give to the public so they can actually reproduce and do. And remember, if you're giving in a, a, if, you, if you have a patent, you have a patent in a certain jurisdiction for a very limited time. So other jurisdictions, it's working fine. If you have a US patent and you're releasing the CC0 code in Israel, it won't apply. You're opening up this possibility at the same time. So you don't, you sometimes close things and open up. And yes, you don't have to declare that you have this. But then again, when you write software, and this is something on the other perspective, if you write software and you're violating someone's patent and you put it and release it under an open source license, you actually are doing something even worse. And people don't know it because they think, oh, I'm writing open source software, it's my idea. Sometimes you have to be careful and you do have to check the patent registration if you're actually writing software. So you... you, you you have to do it regardless. Do it make sense? I don't think I don't think it changes work. I think you can you can try Uh okay, I this is a discussion we'll have to continue later. Um Anya? Yeah. Okay. Any more time or we're out of time? Oh, sorry. We're out of time. We can talk to it later. Yeah. Thank you.